In previous lectures, we've seen a style of photojournalism emerge that utilizes the photo document with a humanistic perspective. Humanism is a worldview and a moral philosophy that considers humans to be of primary importance, a perspective common to a wide range of ethical stances and attaches importance to human dignity, concerns, and capabilities. The social reformers, Jacob Rees and Lewis Heim are examples of this kind of work. The social realism of Dorothea Lange is another example. These are prototypical of what is often referred to as concerned photography, art with a social conscience. Walker Evans differed in that he blended the photo document with an exacting formal approach to the medium. In his work, the form is as important as content. But as one photographer put it, what about the rest of us unconcerned slobs? Another style of photojournalism emerged, one supported by the economics of mass communication and their increasing use of photography, the sensational. Sensationalism is a type of editorial approach in media which events, topics, and news stories are often overhyped to increase viewership or readership numbers. Their tactics include deliberately appealing to emotions and being purposely controversial. We see that today in both television and radio. One goal of sensational reporting is to increase or sustain viewership or readership so that the news outlets can increase their profits. Mix the sensational with the American culture's expanding fascination of celebrity helps explain this other kind of photojournalism. John Shoemaker wrote, Celebrity worship first emerged in the 1880s, when the notion of cultural hero began to shift from a serious, duty-driven upholder of standards and virtues, such as scholars, inventors, great political leaders, the captains of industry, to a person celebrated primarily for being well-known. According to Smithsonian Institute historian Amy Henderson, this was spurred on by new mass communication technologies of the 1920s and 1930s, as well as by a staggering machine of desire created by the ballooning entertainment industry. All of this formed a part of a wider consciousness shift from character to personality, substance to image, and community to narcissism. It displays the interest in the self. Perhaps the greatest historical example of this new style of photojournalism, the sensational, was Ouija. Ouija was born Usherfelig. He grew up in a part of Austria, which is now part of the Ukraine. His family immigrated to New York City in 1909 when he was 11 years old. He dropped out of school early, and by 14, he'd become an errand boy for a Lower East Side photographic studio. He soon bought his own camera and a pony, which he called Hypo, to make pictures of people's kids for profit. He eventually left home at age 18, and he followed with six years of homelessness. Ouija was his own greatest fan and admirer. The image that you see here on the right was the stamp that he used on the back of his photographs, his trademark, Ouija the Famous. He took the name Ouija because it seemed, as many people told him, that he had the uncanny ability to show up at newsworthy events, sometimes even before the police did. We'll find out a little bit more about that later. He used to wear a large badge on the lapel of his coat that said, Ouija the Famous. By 1918, he was doing a variety of studio and darkroom tasks. From 1924 to 1927, he joined Acme Pictures, which was later absorbed by United Press International, UPI. He worked as a darkroom technician and printer. He also filled in as a news photographer. He sometimes clashed with his boss in the darkroom, 
telling him that he could make better pictures than the ones that were coming in for him to print. Ultimately, his boss gave him that opportunity by firing him, and Ouija started making pictures on his own. The film The Public Eye from 1992 is loosely based on the life of Ouija. Joe Pesci plays Ouija the Famous. I'm going to show you a short clip of this. While the story is fiction, they do actually use some of Ouija's photographs in the film. And then Joe Pesci's character takes on the personality of Ouija. You scared me. I killed him to get the picture. The kid put the hat in there. Huh? His hat. Stick it in. People like to see the dead guy's hat. I'm a freelance photographer. If I'm not on the street by midnight, the whole world passes me by. Dumb officers sometimes say they won't let anybody but you take their picture. I don't do commissions. But I got a good nose for news. Hey, knock it off. <laughs> Burns me clear out of here. You must be kidding. I heard this guy's walking around a meat cleaver sticking out of his head. Thank God I was able to administer his last rites. Ed Corr, Trish, this and Chittle, don't sleep at 10 a.m. This is a new low for you, Burns. Can't blame him guy for trying, right? No matter what he was shooting, he never got involved. My model for 23 years. Except once. I need to ask you a favor. You need a favor for me? She's cold, Burns. Just like everybody else in New York, making the most out of what she has. Thought you never took sides. What are you getting at? You're doing it for her. I hope you're not starting to mistake him for a real person, Mrs. Levitt. You're out of your league here, Bernstein. I don't know just how you think they want to get a real picture. A more impossible picture, they have to notice me. Joe Pesci. I do magic. Barbara Hershey. What are these pictures you're going to take? I need the event to capture the public eye. I gotta get the moment. From Universal Pictures. Everybody wants to have their picture took. Everybody. The public eye. Give me a shot, Bernie! Well, as I said, the story is fictionalized, but the character gives you a sense of Ouija's personality. One of his friends wrote, He was born middle-aged and proceeded to settle into his life, time persona, of the streetwise hustler who accidentally stumbled into a distinguished career. From reviews of his work, some of the words that are often used, naive, lacking worldness and sophistication, artless, unaffected. In 1935, he left Acme News Pictures to begin a freelance career in photography. His activities centered around Manhattan police quarters. His photographs were published in the Herald Tribune, the World Telegram, the Daily News, the Post, the Journal American, the Sun, and other newspapers. You can see in this photograph, the people arrested here are attempting to conceal their identities from Ouija's camera. In 1938, he obtained permission to install a police band radio in his car. This is around the time that he adopted the name Ouija. He took the name Ouija as people told him he had an uncanny ability to show up to newsworthy events just like the Ouija board if you've ever seen that game not knowing that W-E-E-G-E-E -E -E was a complete misspelling. The pre-success Ouija was the Nighthound news cameraman who could put his finger on one of the city's pulsing veins and somehow sense a catastrophe happening miles away. For years, he hardly ever saw daylight, basking instead in the reflected nutrient of flashbulbs, hauling around in his beat-up car, processing his photographs out of the trunk, and then peddling them to any of a dozen newspapers. Like a Salvador Dali with a camera, he was his own greatest fan and self-advertiser, and his stories had a way of being reproportioned until they were mythic. But rather than being a bore, Ouija was truly worthy of his myth. His best work is inseparable from his character. Here you can see a group of photographs that he did of tenement fires. Rather than simply photograph the fire itself, which many photographers would have done, Ouija photographs 
the people it affected, as well as sometimes the crowd that came to witness the event. It's a great photograph here where you can see this couple where the man has grabbed the, the only thing he probably could as he fleed the fire, his best suit. He looks concerned and the woman just kind of looks confused and a little unsettled and surprised at Ouija's flashbulb. Again, photographing the victims of these fires, the sense of the motion on their faces is intense. Ouija works in his pictures to construct a narrative. He often juxtaposes one figure against another, and I'll talk about that a little bit as we go. This is a photograph of a person that was booked on the suspicion of killing a policeman. As you can see from his face, he was likely beaten up in the arrest. This photograph is a crop version of the original. I do have a copy of the original I wanted to show you here. Just so you can see, in that crop version, he's eliminated parts of the image that were distracting from the narrative and instead hones in on the most important elements of this picture. Some of the photographs we're going to look at today, like this one, are pretty gruesome. He certainly photographed a variety of murders, and in fact, murder was, in a sense, part of his business. In his work, you're going to see a certain sense of loneliness, of mortality, and even the vulnerable. Again, a couple of offenders arrested in the back of a paddy wagon. Obtrusively, Ouija is popping his camera into the back of the wagon to photograph the two arrestees. They are trying to protect their identity with their hats. Sense of irony and juxtaposition that you see here. Someone we assume is drunk and passed out, lying next to the Coca-Cola sign. Peter Martin, again one of his friends, wrote, It is perhaps a bit extreme to call Ouija the idiot savant of photography, if only because Ouija was not an idiot. He was a clown, a recontour, a bum with a camera whose ultimate joke was that he was eventually regarded as an artist, when his sole intention was simply to make a living with a camera, have some laughs, and carry off a few pretty, wistful girls. He photographed the street life of New York City. He photographed the nightlife of New York City. He photographed outside as well as in the bars and the restaurants and the clubs. Listening to Frank Sinatra, the Palace Theater, 1944. Again, the emotions on the people's face become primary in so many of Ouija's works. In 1941, his exhibition, Murder is My Business, opened at the Photo League in New York. Mentioned earlier, he's a master at juxtaposition. There's a great example of that here. You can read the title, Teenage Boy Arrested for Strangling a Little Girl. When we see this photograph and the flashbulb highlighting the bars in which this person is behind, we're well aware that he's in trouble. You can see that he's carefully framed the shot in such a way that he has the frame of the kid looking a little bewildered and surprised. But the fact that he allowed this grid of the bars in front makes us immediately aware that this person has likely done something wrong. Another one of his very striking photographs of the police assisting a woman who has just been informed that her husband has been murdered. One of his most famous photographs is this one. It's been titled two different ways. The title I prefer is the one most commonly used called Their First Murder. And indeed, just like the tenement fire photographs where he photographs the victims and, and sometimes the crowd that was attracted by the police in the scene of the fire. In this case, this is a crowd of people on the streets of New York City as the police have discovered a murder. Look at the emotions on the faces here and the gamut of different things going on. You can see a kid over here looks like he's having the time of his life, smiling and laughing, gleeful can see another kid in the foreground that looks a little surprised, probably, by the intrusive photographer and his bright flash bulb. You can see a woman in the background who's weeping. 
And then another little girl here who's leaning forward and kind of looking surprised. Well, the surprise is that there's a kid in the back behind her who's punching her in the back of the head. There's all these different things going on all in one photograph. And it really tells about the gamut of human emotions in a variety of kind of ways. Some people are curious, some people are upset, some people are having fun, some people are horrified all by that same scene. It's an amazing photograph in that respect and one that has had lasting interest. Another photograph where he's photographing the crowd that has gathered outside of murder scene variety of expressions. Here you can see the crowd in the background, but the murder victim in the foreground as the detectives are there gathering evidence. They're all laid out in front of Ouija's camera and they all become part of that story. He photographed the victims of the infamous cake box murder in New York City in 1940. And in this case, you can see the head of the murder victim lying on the street, but you also see part of that is the media, another photographer with his view camera and a dark cloth covering the, the back of the camera so that he can see the image on the ground glass. So the media is part of that whole story, as are the detectives and some of the crowd that you see sort of there in the background. My first father-in-law, Robert LaRouche, was a photographer for the St. Louis Post newspaper. He was a photojournalist. We sometimes talked about Ouija and other photographers. To me, one of the interesting things that he felt, he hated Ouija. He felt that Ouija gave all photographers a bad name. He felt that people thought photographers were essentially ambulance chasers based on these kinds of photographs that Ouija was certainly a master at. The image that you see here from an unidentified photographer shows you Ouija on the right with his crown graphics camera and its large flashbulb as well as the officers standing around protecting the scene as the detectives come to gather evidence. We well, photographed these newsworthy scenes, and again, sometimes they're really quite grisly. You can read the title here, a couple people that had been trampled in a stampede. You can see the surprise of the officer there, and the poor victims lying on the dock. Ouija photographs them almost matter-of-factly, and you can see what's probably a medical examiner here. He provides some of the evidence to us without necessarily taking sides. But he photographs all sorts of different walks of life. They're not all about murder and crimes and accidents. He photographs some of the joyous things, but uh, I love this photograph, particularly when you read the title. If you look at just the image, it looks like a bunch of angry men yelling, and who knows what they're yelling at. And then you read the title, Rehearsal at the Metropolitan Opera. They're opera singers. Or again, the gamut of emotions. And the slide's not the best copy of, the, uh, of this image that I've ever seen. But indeed, it's absolutely one of Ouija's greatest photographs. If you read the title, Drown Man, Coney Island, 1940. And if you look in the foreground, you have the emergency workers who are trying to resuscitate this man. In the background, all of the faces look concerned. Everybody looks concerned. But there's one woman there, and we can assume by her association to the drowned man is probably his girlfriend or his wife. And she's smiling for Ouija's camera. She's aware of his presence. And like many of us today, we're trained to smile for the camera, and that's what she does. It almost seems like she's enjoying the event where nobody else there is. The sense of irony in this photograph is absolutely profound, and it's partly the strength of this image. 
Again, another one of his very famous photographs is this one entitled The Critic. He uses, once again, juxtaposition. You can see the woman on the right standing and looking at the two women on the left. The women on the left are dressed to the hilt with their fancy gowns and their nice coats, and they both have tiaras and plenty of jewelry, makeup, the whole bit. In essence, you can kind of get a sense of their affluence. And they're probably there to attend a gala ball or maybe the opening of a, a show or something like that. If you look, they're both looking at Rigi. They're smiling for the camera. Their attention is only towards the photographer, not to the woman on the right who's paying no attention to Rigi, who's looking at them in a way that's kind of snarling. And indeed, if you look at her, she's dressed a little less affluently. She, her clothes, in comparison, maybe look a little bit shabby. When you look at this image, it really becomes about social and class differences, how one class kind of ignores the other. There's certainly a variety of emotions going on. The women on the left are happily unaware or certainly ignoring the woman on the right, who seems very angered at their presence. Ouija constructs his narratives, sometimes quite purposefully, in ways that are humorous and somewhat derogatory. You look at this image and what you see is a man on a cart posed essentially next to a horse's ass. And then you read the title, Joan McWilliam, Professional Anti-Semite, Nazi Lover. Essentially what Ouija's seen in a photograph like this is Joan McWilliam is a horse's ass. Ouija the Famous, in this case, went to Coney Island, I think it was 1940. He made this photograph that he got up above and had a microphone and yelled to everybody, Hey, who wants to be photographed by Ouija the Famous? And as you can see, everybody turns around in this crowded mass of people on Coney Island, likely on a hot summer day, and they're all waving for the camera. It's their 15 minutes or 15 seconds of fame. In 1943, five of his photographs were acquired by the Museum of Modern Art in New York and included in their exhibition, Action Photography. He photographed the nightclub scenes. He photographed the opening of the operas that you see here. This is likely done with infrared film. We'll talk a little bit more about that as we go on in these slides. But he also photographed in less classy environments, Sammy's on the Bowery, which was a well-known late hour nightclub in the Bowery section of New York City. Photographing all sorts of lives from different backgrounds. People enjoying themselves on New Year's Eve. Ouija himself enjoyed the nightlife. You can see there's a couple of admirers here kissing him on the cheek. And indeed, as I looked up Ouija photographs, there are a whole bunch of photographs of either him kissing pretty women or pretty women kissing him, as you see in these photographs. In 1945, the publication Naked City was the first book of Ouija's photographs. It accompanied a national publicity tour, and he began photographing for Vogue magazine. Two years later, in 1947, he left New York for Hollywood to serve as a consultant on film version of Naked City. During the next several years, he worked as a technical consultant on films and played minor film roles as well. He also began to experiment with a variety of different lenses and other techniques creating distortions. Well, I mentioned earlier that I would talk a little bit more about his use of infrared film. Infrared is a spectrum of light that the human eye cannot see, but there is film that was developed to record infrared light, which can some ways be measured in heat. The infrared film, if you put a block out filter in front of a flash, blocking out all visible light to the human eye, but it still allows the infrared light to emit from the flash. The film can record that infrared light, but again, we can't see it. 
So in essence, it gives the photographer an opportunity to make photographs in darkened rooms, like you see of these kids in the Palace Theater who are watching Saturday matinees, most likely. Ouija's photographing them without them being aware. They're in a dark room, and he's firing off a flash, which essentially the film sees, but our eye does not. So they're completely unaware that they're being photographed. Sometimes he renders them doing activities they probably would not like to be photographed in. I wish I could find a slide of it. I couldn't, but I've seen a photograph of a kid in the movie theater from Ouija with his finger so far up his nose, you'd be surprised that a finger could go that far up a nose. It's a great photograph, but again, on the internet, I just couldn't find an example of it. But I think you can tell in many of these photographs, these are things likely people didn't expect to be photographed doing. In 1952, Ouija returned to New York. He had spent several years in Hollywood. He began a series of portraits while he was there. This is a photograph made in front of a gun shop. Ironically, the building that you see across the street with the bars in the window is a New York City police precinct. I found this other photograph here. Again, it's not a, a great photograph, but it shows Ouija in action as he's up on the ledge of the building photographing the gun. And again, the irony is the gun's pointing towards the police precinct. Well, while he was in Hollywood, he gained access to many of the celebrities there, and he started doing these distorted portraits. He called them caricatures. In a way, he started listening to so many people that had been telling him, oh, Ouija, you're a great artist, you're a great artist, you're a great photographer. He started taking that a in some ways a little too seriously. When we look at his greatest works, they're really in some ways the most unassuming and the most naive. As he started doing these, in retrospect, they kind of appear clunky and unsophisticated and perhaps even a little bit silly, as you see in this image here. His distorted portraits were published in Vogue magazine in 1955. In 1958, he became a consultant for Stanley Kubrick's film, Dr. Strangelove, or How I Stop Worrying and Learn to Love the Bomb. He traveled extensively in Europe until 1968, working for the Daily Mirror on a variety of photography, film, lecture, and book projects. In 1959, he did a lecture tour in the Soviet Union in conjunction with exhibitions held there. In 1961, his autobiography, Ouija by Ouija, was published, and you can see here a picture of Ouija with his camera sitting in a throne with his ever-present cigar in his mouth and enjoying the limelight. He died in 1968 at the age of 69. Well, one of the things that's happened really since Ouija is this sense of the sensational has been developed even more and more so to the point that we now have a term for that kind of photography, paparazzi. As you can read here, the term paparazzi came from a character in a Federico Fellini film. The, the photographer characters was named paparazzo. And I'm gonna show you a short little video outtake of Fellini's film.
So the aggressive news hound photographic personality essentially over time evolves or devolves into the paparazzi that we have today. Where Ouija's work was sensationalist, the other side of the photojournalistic coin was W. Eugene Smith, known for his humanistic approach to photography. He began his career by taking pictures for two local newspapers, the Wichita Eagle, which was morning circulation, and the evening circulation, the Beacon. He moved to New York City and began to work for Newsweek magazine and became known for his perfectionism as well as his thorny personality. Smith was eventually fired from Newsweek for refusing to use a medium format camera and instead joined Life magazine in 1939. He had a career in photography for some 40 years, from 1938 to 1978. He set the standards for what has been called humanistic journalism or the concerned photographer. He wrote, as a photographic journalist, the burden of responsibility must remain right within my own conscience. He often photographed men and women at work, but he photographed the lives of people from all over the world. His predecessors were Jacob Rees and his book, How the Other Half Lives, as well as Lewis Hine and his interest in child labor. Smith took up humanitarian causes. He had a personal commitment to the causes that he photographed. He wrote, It is my belief that the photographic journalist must get as close to his subjects as is possible. He must live closely enough to his subjects for his photograph to show intimate knowledge. The result is dependent upon honesty. He must be honest with them and honest with himself. As a correspondent for Ziff Davis Publishing and Life Magazine, Smith entered World War II on the front lines of the island-hopping American offensive against Japan, photographing U.S. Marines and Japanese prisoners of war at Saipan, Guam, Iwo Jima, and Okinawa. On Okinawa, Smith was hit by mortar fire. After recovering, he continued at Life Magazine and perfected his approach to the photo essay from 1947 to 1954. Here's a couple of his war images, and indeed you might remember I showed you a few of these images when I talked about war photography. His photo essays at a glance provided a popular understood narrative. He used captions along with photos to create the human interest stories that he worked on. He did a variety of essays throughout his career. Most noteworthy among them were The Country Doctor, which you're seeing here in 1948. I'll show you examples of the Spanish Village in a few minutes from 1950 and 51, Man of Mercy, Albert Schweitzer, 1954, The Nurse Midwife in 1955, and then his last photo essay, again, I'll show you examples of these all, was Minamata in 1975. What I'm doing here is providing you with the two-page picture layouts in Life magazine. This is a story of a country doctor in Colorado. You can see when doctors still made house calls, he went house to house and place to place, helping his patients. And you have a variety of patients here with a variety of ailments. The captions added additional information to the story. The image on the right is perhaps the most famous photograph from this essay. Indeed, this essay in particular was so popular and people were so interested in that many years after this essay was completed, Public TV did a special on the doctor and included follow-ups on many of his patients, something that I saw a number of years ago on Public TV. So headlines and captions that add information to the photographs, but the photographs, as you can see, are prominent, displayed next to the captions. Sometimes the images overpower the words, but both are used to create a more complete story. He worked for Life magazine for over 10 years. 
Again, a fairly famous image from this sequence on the right. His later story of the nurse midwife in the South. And again, you're seeing the two page spreads taken from the magazine, as well as some of the individual photographs. Another one of his famous essays was The Spanish Village. Pictures play the dominant role. Several of these photographs are, have become quite famous as well. I'm going to include a couple of images pulled out of the sequence so you can look at the images more closely. Like a Spanish soldiers or the weaver. Part of the Spanish village essay was this photograph of a family mourning their deceased loved one. This image in particular provides a stark contrast between the approach of W. Gene Smith and Ouija. As you saw in Ouija's photographs of death, particularly with murders, they're kind of garish in comparison. He is a flashbulb and the photographer himself was somewhat intrusive. This certainly would have been a difficult place to photograph, and one of the things that Eugene Smith didn't want to do was to interrupt the family. I think Ouija would have popped off a few flashes, taken his pictures, and left. In this case, Eugene Smith had learned that if you pre-expose film, in other words, if you take the film out of its canister and expose it to subtle, subdued light, it would actually activate the film and allow him to put the film back in the camera and then photograph in a lower light situation without the need for a flash. This photograph was illuminated by a few candles in the room. Having the sensitivity of the film activated by pre-exposing it to light allowed Eugene Smith to make this photograph being less intrusive to the family and being less of an interruption, and in essence, being a bit more transparent, which is something that most contemporary photojournalists strive for. Smith left Life magazine with disputes with his editors. He wanted full artistic authority over the presentation of his images, something that Life seldom, if ever, gave to their photographers. He severed his ties with Life over the way in which the magazine used his photographs from this essay on Albert Schweitzer. Schweitzer was the 1952 Nobel Peace Prize winner. He founded a hospital in Africa. Some of the images from that series you're seeing here. When he left Life magazine, he instead went to work for Magnum. Again, Magnum still exists. It's one of the premier photojournalistic agencies today. It was co-founded by Henri Cartier-Bresson and Robert Capa. Smith went on to win three Guggenheim Foundation fellowships, pretty much unheard of in the life of a photographer. I did research one time on the Guggenheim and basically found out that one-tenth of one percent of all photographers who apply for a Guggenheim ever receive one in their lifetime. For Smith to get three tells you something about his presence and his importance as a photojournalist and within the history of photography. His last series of work, his last photo essay, was Minamata. I met Smith soon after he had returned from Minamata. His photographs there tell the story of a small fishing village in Japan. There was a local manufacturer that was dumping dangerous chemicals, mercury and other chemicals, into the bay. Then the fishermen were fishing. The local population were eating those fish and becoming poisoned. Indeed, Smith was warned by the company that was dumping the chemicals. If I recall, they made fiberglass objects. He was warned by the company to stop making these photographs because he was exposing essentially what they were doing. He ignored their warning, and frankly, the company sent some hired hands to beat him. And they did, and they nearly killed him. After the attack, his sight in one eye completely deteriorated. When I met him, he was still recovering from that. 
he certainly cared very much about stopping these kinds of actions because he showed pictures of what the mercury poisoning was doing. Children, babies were being born with birth defects, as you see in this photograph, and this very moving photograph of a mother bathing her child deformed by mercury poisoning at birth. One of my colleagues at Chico State, who used to work in the admissions office, had worked with W. Eugene Smith and basically confirmed the rumors about his personality, that he was thorny, that he was difficult. While my colleague loved Eugene Smith and admired him and admired his work, and indeed the colleague had been a photographer for National Geographic magazine before joining the staff at Chico State, he did also confirm that Smith suffered from drug addiction, that he basically was a workaholic. He notably had taken amphetamines for over a long period over his life. Eventually, that and alcohol use led to a massive stroke from which he died in 1978. In a way, taking over the reins from W. Eugene Smith as contemporary photographer, and I'm just going to show you a few of Sebastio Salgado's work. Salgado was a Brazilian-born photographer, trained as an economist, took up the camera to record the conditions that people worked in. These are some of the pictures from the uh, gold mines that he photographed in Brazil. But he's been all over the world making photographs of working people and working conditions, sometimes exposing the extremely difficult conditions that people are working in, as you see in these photographs of mines. He, in essence, takes that humanistic approach that we saw perhaps first in Jacob Rees and Lewis Hine, exemplified in the 20th century by W. Eugene Smith. And certainly Salgado is a spectacular, great photographer that I don't do justice by just showing you a half dozen images or so.